I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you very much for the invite. Um, I'm not going to talk about um, space settlements as such, but um, I'm going to talk about propulsion, because I'm not going to talk about near-field things. As you, as you already heard mentioned, you heard about uh, Artemis, and well, maybe not Artemis so much, but uh, the gateway um, idea of having something orbiting around the moon and out to the uh, um, L1 site, and then uh, possibly going to Mars. So we're thinking the moon is, what, 2022, they said they're going to start the first launch? And then maybe people on, on the moon by 2024. I may be a little optimistic, but uh, that's what they're saying online anyway, if you check, check the websites. And then um, we've also got um, SpaceX, which are making claims that they want to get to, to Mars by 2024 or so, and maybe even a space city on Mars by uh, 2050, which again, may be a little bit optimistic, but uh, who knows, who knows? So, uh, but I'm not talking about that either. <laughs> I just wanted to mention it, because you've already heard that be mentioned uh, at this meeting today. So uh, I want to talk about going a little bit further afield. So I'm thinking not, not to Mars, not to the moon, not to Mars, a little bit further afield, maybe to the next, next uh, habitable planet, possibly. But then you're going to ask, well, how on earth are we going to get to the next habitable planet? It'll take about 17,000 years to get there with, with standard rockets. So that's not going to work. We're not going to take fuel and, and, and propel ourselves to the, to the nearest habitable planet. That's not going to happen. But um, possibly what we could do is use an exotic kind of propulsion that doesn't require a propellant. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today a little bit. Um, so just recently, uh, we've had uh, some uh, press uh, in Scientific American, uh, a good kind of crazy, because <laughs> this might sound a bit, bit weird to you, uh, a, a rocket with no propellant, that sounds a bit, a bit strange, uh, but uh, this might be the good kind of crazy, as NASA says. Um, so, uh, of course, what we'd really like to do is, is, uh, is go by wormhole, that would be the, the uh, class A kind of uh, first class way to, 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 to go from A to B, of course. And I've got a little picture there of a guy going through a wormhole. It could, of course, it wouldn't happen quite like that. But there are people out there, believe me, uh, people in the general relativity community that are very interested in working on wormholes. And uh, I spoke to some in England uh, this earlier this summer. And uh, we're thinking about having meetings in, in the England and uh, elsewhere on the subject of wormholes. So uh, that's, that's coming up. So think about that in the next 50 years or so. <laughs> so uh, people are seriously thinking about it. So believe me, it's, the, it's going to be there in the, in the, in the future. But uh, for right now, um, uh, the project I'm going to talk to you about is a, a NIAC-funded project. For those of you that don't know, NIAC is NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. And uh, you we've heard it mentioned a couple of times today. Um, I might, of course, I'm not working on this alone. I'm working with a team. And my team members include uh, Chip Atkins, and John Brandenburg, uh, Marshall Eubanks, uh, Gary Hudson, who's a program manager, uh, Dan Kennefick, Paul March, uh, Jonathan Woodland, who's our design and, and uh, machinist. Uh, we've also got Jim Woodward, who's the actual PI on, on the project, and who I've been working with for the last six years now. So uh, our concept, uh, we've got some concept art here, there of a, of a possible um, probe that could maybe take us to Alpha Centauri, or Proxima Centauri, um, and uh, that would be the closest uh, habitable, or possibly habitable planet. Of course, one, what you want to do first, of course, before you even set out there, is to think about, uh, let's, go, let's go to see the, the solar lens and take a look at this thing. So we don't even know, do we need to take cameras? Do we need to take radar? What do we take with us uh, to, to actually see the surface and find out if it's habitable or not? So um, the first thing to do really would be go, go to the solar lens and then uh, see if you can actually Im image the surface using Einstein's rings, you know, using the sun as a, as a like a lens, a focal point. So um, anyway, that would be a, a, an initial mission. But uh, I want to actually tell you about the propulsion system because that's what I'm working on. And again, it's, a, it's an exotic propulsion system. It, it uses sort of gravitation as the way to propel forward, or the, at least the energy in the gravitational field. So what you see there is a little mega drive. It looks suspiciously like uh, a transducer or a little, little um, os oscill os oscillating PZT stack, which is basically what it is. And you may be thinking, well, we've known about these things uh, for large van little stacks for 100 years now, and, and we've never seen anything about, never heard anything about propulsion before. But that's because no one's ever tried to measure it before. Trying to measure something which is uh, 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 9 newtons is uh, very difficult to do. You have to have a special torsional pendulum. You have to make all kinds of precautions about vibrations and stuff. So um, what we're talking about here is something that might deliver forces on the, on the size of, of uh, micronewtons. So really, really small forces. So I'm not saying I can go to the plant, go to the planet uh, next week or next month. It could be a few years down the road, but this is a <laughs> few years. So, but this is a system that, that seems to produce some force 
very, very small amount of force. And maybe to, uh, initially we might want to use it for satellite station keeping, that kind of thing, because it re re does require absolutely zero propellant. All we need is electricity, and then we, we can make a motion and make this thing actually move, uh, which is kind of strange, which I'm going to try and explain to you now in, in a very simple slide it is difficult to understand how on earth can I oscillate something and have it move well this is and it's not just a slipstick thing either so don't think about slipstick and Dean drives it's nothing like that this is more what it's like uh, see that little guy in the boat there or I should call it a skull see how that I don't know if you ever uh, tried to row one of these things but the seat moves backwards and forwards so imagine that the the sea there is is the, the gravitational potential field of the universe right and um, and the guy, instead of having oars, imagine him having two really big buckets, almost like dustbins. Try and imagine that. So imagine he slips forward in his seat, right, and then dunks the buckets into the water. He makes himself a lot heavier. And then he slowly moves back with this extra mass. What happens to the boat? Well, it sort of slips forward in the water a little bit, doesn't it? Because you've made it heavier, and then you, and you're, you're moving its center of mass backward. Then you dump the mass out, dump the water out of the buckets, and then you slide forward again. That sliding forward, it may actually move the boat back just a little bit, but remember, you're a lot lighter now. You're lighter than you were before. So if you move back when you're heavy, it'll actually shift the boat underneath you. And that's the sort of motion I'm wanting. But you have to imagine the mass, this thing getting heavier and lighter and heavier and lighter. That's actually what's happening to my little PZT stack over there. So the PZT, what I'm suggesting, is that it changes mass by a very, very, very small amount, maybe a plank mass, something really tiny that you'd hardly be able to measure. Um, but that's enough. If I get it just at the right moment, if I push it just when it's getting lighter and pull back when it's getting heavier, or the other way around, I can move it in one direction and possibly move it back the other direction as well just by changing frequency. So it turns out I can move it one way at a certain frequency. If I alter the frequency just a little bit above the resonance, I can move it back the other way. So I don't even have to turn this motor around. I can, I can make it go forward and backward just by changing the frequency, which is pretty cool. So um, anyway, that, so that's basically the idea. I'm trying to get energy from the gravitational potential of the field. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what is the gravitational potential just out there? You probably have heard of things like a slingshot effect, where, where you have a, a satellite that goes around Jupiter or something, and it, it speeds up as it gets whipped around. Well, it, it's kind of like that, but remember, we're out in space. Where there's nothing there. There's no big planets to, to really swoosh around. So the, the energy that I'm thinking of is really coming from the distant planets in the distant, not planets, but distant, distant uh, stars in the universe, or dis distant matter in the universe. So my next slide gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. You've probably come across um, the idea of um, space-time as a rubber sheet, right? And then they tell you that you put a big mass on the rubber sheet and it, and it bends and things flow around in, in the curvature of space-time, right? But what they probably forgot to tell you is that to have that rubber sheet behave that way, you have to stretch it out at the edges. You have to have those springs on the trampoline that I've drawn there. Okay, and that gives you that tension. So basically what I'm trying to say is that the universe itself has a potential energy. And we're sort of tapping into that, just like the water in, in the lake there. We're tapping into that energy. So we don't actually have to have a huge planet right next to us or, or a big solar mass object or even a black hole right next to us. We can, we can use the energy that's already there in the universe and tap into it. Just a little tiny bit at a time. And the universe itself has to recoil. But of course, if you can't tell the recoil from, from uh, uh, Jupiter when, when the satellite goes around, you're hardly going to be able to tell the recoil from the universe if, if, uh, if we accelerate some small object uh, to go faster and faster. So what I'm saying is the energy from this object isn't coming from the, the uh, electromagnetic energy that we put in. It's coming from the energy potential of the universe. So it's like saying, um, I've got a boat, I've got a sailing ship on the, on the water. I've got all these sailors pulling on the ropes and doing all these things to get the boat in such a way that it'll catch the wind. But it's the wind that actually pushes the thing. That's what I'm saying. So we're putting in the energy to put, it in, put our, our device in the right state to be able to get the energy from the universe. But then the universe is supplying that potential energy to move it on. So we don't have over unity or anything of that, that nature uh, going on. So, so if we've got these little tiny bitty forces, how are we going to measure those little forces? Well, we use a, a torsional pendulum. I'm wondering what that thing was in the middle of the screen. I wasn't even, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't actually see that orange thing. I thought, what was that? Anyway, it's gone now. <laughs> just, I'm good, I'm good. I actually went to fetch glasses, and I think I just left them somewhere. No worries. Ah, yeah, okay. Now I can actually see the slides. I don't need to see the slides, what I use. <laughs> I know what's on the slides. So, so there's a torsional pendulum there. 
And basically what you see, I wish I had a pointer though, uh, but I can't move away from this. So you'll be able to hear me. If I move away, you can't, you can't hear me. So I've got to stay here. But what you see there is a, is a torsional pendulum. It sort of moves in and out of the page, if you like. On the right-hand side there, you see a Faraday cage. And inside that is the little device that I'm talking about. So basically it's a little PZT stack, that's lead zirconium titanate. It's a little piezoelectric device that uh, basically as you put um, electromagnetic energy in, you just put in a sinusoidal wave, it, it sort of uh, gets it, it sort of moves in a, in a very strange kind of way. It, it sort of gets, uh, gets fatter and, and, and its radius decreases a little bit and it actually changes shape. And while it's changing shape, it, it absorbs a bit of energy. And while it's doing that, it's changing its mass just a tiny, tiny little bit. And that's the change in mass that I want to produce motion out of. Anyway, um, in the center of that, that column, you see a bunch of wires going in. That's the power supply. And uh, there's actually galastan contacts there, liquid metal contacts, so that the, the wires aren't pulling the thing off to one side and creating a torque. And then on the left-hand side, you see the weights. They're just counterbalancing the Faraday cage. So you're not going to get any tip-tilt kind of business going on. And again, underneath the weights is a funny black box there. And that black box uh, holds a, um, a probe, and it's got a stepper motor in it. So I can move this thing in and out if I want to. And, it's, and basically, the probe has a, has a little laser light, which is shining on a shiny surface. And it gives me displacement really, really accurately. So I can measure displacement, and from the displacement, I can get the force. And, and that's basically how we, uh, how we measure the force from this thing. So I'm measuring the displacement from a Filtec D D63 sensor, which is got on there on the left. Now, um, the little coils that you see underneath the Faraday cage there, I can use those things to calibrate the device. So I can put a known, a known voltage or a known current through, and from the known current, using elliptic equations and stuff, I can derive very, very accurately what the force is. And we've just recently had that measured, actually. Uh, some guy put, uh, not, not some guy, but uh, George Hathaway in Canada, he put the, uh, the coils onto a scale and actually weighed them so we know exactly what the calibration is. And so we can say we've now done it to NEST standards. So we, we're very sure about the results that we're getting now on this thing. So we, we've had this, the coils actually calibrated properly by weighing. You can imagine just that if you, if you put the coils on, on, a, on a weighing machine, you can sort of get, make them go heavier or make them go lighter, and you can de detect the difference as you put the current through. So that's basically what happened. So we've calibrated it really quite accurately now. Anyway, moving on. Uh, that's how we, uh, that's the device that we used. This is a rather technical thing, it's showing um, uh, the signal generator and then goes, goes through a transformer to bo boost up the, uh, the amplitude and then it, it, we have some sensors and it goes into the vacuum chamber which is that strange box at the lower, lower uh, right there and then we have all the things that we detect and uh, some picoscopes that we use to detect. They're fairly fast um, digital kind of, kind of oscilloscopes uh, that we use for the detection. And this is the sort of thing that we've been seeing. Uh, as you see there, the, the, the blue sort of top hat look, looking uh, curve, that's the voltage. So imagine applying a voltage for a certain amount of seconds. It looks like about, uh, hang on just a second, about 10 seconds there, I would say. Um, and that strange wavy red line, that's the actual uh, displacement, which is converted into force. And, uh, and you see when we turn on the signal, you get a, a big transient. And then, uh, it, it, remember, it's a bounce, so it's going to swing backwards a little bit. And then it seems to go down to a lower value, so it stays, it displaces off to, for a short time. So the whole balance beam is now displaced. And then um, when you switch off, it swings back again a little bit, and then it goes more or less back to where it was before. You get a slight thermal increase, so it, it tilts upwards a little bit because of the uh, thermal, thermal business. So what you're seeing there, I'm just going to have a quick look at my slide again. Yes, it's using an ENI amplifier <laughs> it's with a two-to-one transformer. And uh, the force there, I must say, we, we did a recalibration, and after uh, George weighed the, the coils for us, we found out that we'd been overestimating just a little tiny bit. So a factor of four, actually, it wasn't that tiny. But, but uh, anyway, the, so the, the forces I've, I've put there are actually a little bit bigger than they're supposed to be this, by a factor of four. But even so, we're still in the micronewton sort of range. And this was actually a not very good one, so I'm, I'm showing you one that's not so great. Um, I haven't shown you the best possible ones out there. I'm, I'm showing you, I'm being real here, you know. <laughs> this is the kind of your average run-of-the-mill device that we, we're using. And then there you see forward minus reverse. And the why we did that was that if, if a signal doesn't reverse properly, if you, so if you put the device in one direction, you expect the force to go one way. If you actually physically turn it around, you'd expect the force to go the other way. If you get some splurious noise in there that isn't reversing properly, that would cancel out if you take forward runs minus reverse runs. So that's what I'm showing you. And then this other slide is, um, I believe that's forward plus reverse. So that would show you all the noise. So you see there's some transient there, but there's really nothing else. It's kind of more like a flat line. So you're not really seeing much in the way of extra noise on, on top of our signal. So that's what I wanted to show you. Um, 
There's a different one. Again, the, my amplifier was about on the fritz there. We see that strange sort of uh, looking shape. It sort of went on and then, and then the, the power went down for some reason. So I think that, that amplifier was on the way out at that moment. So it's not surprising that our forces aren't very good, but um, we've had a few problems with amplifiers, blown up a few. Even ones that said that they couldn't possibly be blown up, you know, it's a very special type A type lab amplifier. We managed to blow them up. We, we have no problem blowing up amplifiers. So <laughs> we're trying to get one fixed right now, and, uh, and we're actually having a couple specially made for us that will do exactly what we want it to do, so we can actually tune in eight different devices at once and actually use more than one at a time. Because the forces are so small, one of them isn't really going to help us very much, but maybe two, maybe four, maybe eight, you know? And then all of a sudden, we can, we can do a whole bunch at once. So we have a couple of our electronic guys uh, electrical engineers working on this and making those really nice amplifiers specifically for our purpose. And then hopefully we won't blow those up as well. So. And uh, some, some other thing, people do worry about uh, vibration, and I'm, I'm going to stop in a few minutes. I just wanted to show you that we've had bought one of these very fancy Polytech vibrometers, and we can shine it on the beam and see exactly how much it's vibrating and, what, and at what frequency. So um, there's a funny Polytech um, uh, a vibrometer over there on the, on the left-hand side. Um, and there you see, in the middle, you see that our plastic vacuum chamber. Yes, it's plastic. I keep telling Jim we need to get a stainless steel one, but he, li he likes to... Well, this is his reason, see? Now we can shine the laser beam through it. You can't do that with a stainless steel one unless you have the special windows in the right place. So we can shine this laser beam on any part of the beam we want, any part at all, because it's all plastic. And, of course, lasers go straight through the plastic. Not infrared, of course, but lasers can go straight through. So this one's actually shining on the Faraday cage right now. And, uh, and there you see a picture on the right uh, where the vibrometer is on a big tripod and it's a very stable tripod. And uh, we've got the laser beam shi shining right on the Faraday cage. And uh, what you'll see is a couple of pictures. Here's one where we, we don't have the device turned on. So that's just like, like background noise. Yeah, if I just quickly look at my screen here. Yes, it's saying that it's picking up something around 30 hertz, which is kind of background kind of noise, if you like. Um, and then, of course, we turn on the device to see what kind of vibration we get to that. So what we were using at the time was 36 kilohertz going to our device, okay? So this is what we actually saw from the vibrometer. We saw that. And uh, oh, it's actually 31 kilohertz, I said. So this is the, la uh, the laser vibrometer spot. It's giving us um, uh, a vibration of... 24 kilohertz, and uh, by the way, this is not transmitted to the beam, and I can show you that in the next slide, because I, I also moved the, uh, moved the laser vibrometer just across onto the beam a little bit, uh, just off the Faraday cage, and I can show you that next, and there's virtually nothing there. So, so we do a very good job of, from the yoke holding the Faraday cage to the, to the balance beam of not transmitting any of that vibration. So here's the next bit. Yeah, and there's the, I've now put the laser beam, the laser spot, if you look in the middle, I put it on the actual beam now. So you can see where the laser spot is. It's next to the Faraday cage, but on the actual balance arm, the bit that would move. So let me go ahead and show you what the uh, vibrometer results were like. So on the left-hand side, you see before we turn the beam on, before we turn the uh, dev device on, so there's no 31 kilohertz going to our device at the moment, and you see the background kind of noise there. It says, uh, it says it's roughly at 33 hertz, which is, again, some kind of background noise. And then I turn the device on, the 31 kilohertz, through our, our little PZT, piezoelectric device, and it didn't really do much different. And as you can see on the right-hand side there, that's what I got. There's really no clear vibration at all. It's just background noise. So really none of that uh, 24 kilohertz that, was vi that Faraday was vibrating at, Faraday cage, none of it seems to be transmitted to the arm itself. Um, just, just so I could show you that. Um, so. Um, we also put it on the left-hand side, and again, this, the vibrometer only detects vibration. It will not detect a DC, a kind of steady shift. So I can't use it instead of that Filtech de uh, device for measuring displacement. It will only measure vibration. So on the left-hand side, again, you can see uh, before I turn the device on, on the left-hand side, and when the device was actually running um, on the, on the right-hand side. Okay, and, and we also put it on the central arm. I won't bother with you uh, uh, talking about that. And, uh, and then finally, we know we have some guys out in Dres uh, Dresden group have got their own d um, interesting experiments going on. And uh, the very, the most interesting one for me anyway, is that they happen to have a couple of our devices 
and they want to put them on a, a magnetic levitation system. So they've just got the vacuum chamber, which is a huge chamber. It's some, you can almost get inside the damn thing, it's so big. So they, we, they were waiting for that to be delivered when I was there last, last time in, in January. But uh, they've got this huge couple of meters by a couple of meters square kind of vacuum chamber. They have this rather large um, device that was designed by a master's student. I believe he got an award in Germany for, for designing this uh, magnetic levitation system. And they've built it so they could actually put uh, EM drives on that thing. So they want to test EM drives on this thing that will spin around, basically. It's like the MIT one that they have, but it's much, much bigger and it doesn't wobble. So <laughs> this is a very fancy kind of magnetic levitation system. And they're also hoping to put our devices on there too. So they have two of our devices. They'll probably use both of them because of the very, very small forces they produce. But we're hoping that they'll be able to see some kind of rotation, even if they have to speed it up using a camera trick, you know, and take, a, take a movie and then, then speed it up so you can actually see it moving. So I'm really hoping that that's going to work out, but they haven't done it yet. So, um, but anyway, that's that's pretty much where I wanted to conclude. Um, of course, they've seen similar things to us. That's what they've seen in their device, and um, and then that's pretty much where I wanted to end it. So thank you very much. And I thought you were going to be eating while I was doing this, hence uh, bon appetit. But <laughs> thank you. <laughs> If I do you have any questions while the next speaker is coming up? Yes. Oh. Oh, absolutely. Our our um, our vacuum chamber is sitting on a huge granite slab, and then that's sitting on these huge. You know the things that those big legs that they use for the optical tables is sitting on those things. So I even took it off the little spindly metal legs that the granite stand came on and put it on those really honking big, you know, foot wide things. And uh, yeah, so we've got a desk which is say this kind of size, and our chamber sits on that. Yeah. Yes. I wish I wish I could tell you tomorrow, but it's not going to be that <laughs> that fast. Unfortunately, what we've got now is micronewtons, so we can readily do a micronewton type force. So. 10, 20, 20 micronewtons. We could, we, if we had a, an array of these things, and we have to, we have to really prove the, the concept of that first. We, we've done two, and I've seen the, the effect double. But I want to do four. I want to do eight, and I'm probably going to need a bigger vacuum chamber at that point because they probably won't fit in the vacuum chamber. Um, but uh, maybe I'll take the devices to Dresden. They've got much bigger vacuum chambers over there, and, and, and they've been asking me to come back over there. So I will most certainly go over there. They're, they're a great team over there. Yes. Oh, I would say probably with eight, we can already get an observable uh, acceleration. I mean, the, the ones that the, the guys that have the uh, ion drives, what are they, milli, milli newtons? So um, I think if we get a slightly better design and maybe get five micronewtons out of ours, we, can, we could maybe just use an array and then, and then put it up. So um, I, think we could, I think we can do it that in, in probably a few years, I would say. Any other questions? Oh, he was asking how small of a probe, how small of a spaceship were we, were we thinking of? I, I, I'm assuming you're thinking of the interstellar mission type space. No, just, just a satellite type. Not, really a, not, not a cube sat, I'm thinking small sat, because we'd need quite a few of them to, to do any, any real good. Although, if you're willing to wait, we could probably do an orbital transfer with ma as many as maybe f eight or ten. But it will just take a while. But maybe just to stabilize a little bit, maybe we could already do that with a, with a, a dozen of them. So it's possible to do that. But um, the guys at Dresden, they can also go down to much, much higher vacuum than we can. I mean, we're at, to, at the point where uh, it's five, just less than five millitor, and that's like being 80, 80 kilometers up, which is barely on that line where they call it the, uh, where, you, where you cross over to, the, to outer space, just barely. But uh, Dresden could take it down much, much lower than that if we need to. But so, um, so th I'm hoping that they'll do some of the testing for us just because we just don't have the equipment in Fullerton. Yes, the, uh, the, the thing about the, uh, the not so crazy business, that was Scientific American August uh, this year. Yeah, it just recently came out. Was there another question over there? Yes. Uh, 
Well, the power needed to run it at the moment is, is not very all that favorable. Um, I won't lie to you, right now we're using maybe 200 or so watts and we're only getting micronewtons out. Although, um, there have been occasions where we've, we've had this thing on a, a really good resonance and we've seen more, more uh, force for less power. And by less power, I'm talking about 50 watts. So uh, there is a possibility that we could lower the, the, uh, the power needed to get those micronewtons out. And I, and I have seen it, it's just that it's not consistent. We, we run it and then suddenly we run it too much and, and the, 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 material, the pr material properties are not that great. If, they, if you get cracking in them, uh, then we seem to lose the ability to, they don't work as well. And they change frequency on us and there's a bunch of things right now that we still don't fully understand. But we're working on it. We're trying to get a better model to, to, to really predict that kind of thing and, and basically shoot the way forward and, and hopefully. Okay, I'm, I'm done. Would the next speaker like to come up?